Labą dieną, žiūrite laidą Tiek žinių kalba daktaras ir šiandien su mumis yra Paul Offit, Skiepų edukacijos centro Filadelfijos ligoninėje, vaikų ligoninėje vadovas, pediatras, kurio specializacija infekcinės ligos, virusologija ir immunologija. Beveik 22 šimtų mokslinių straipsnių ir keleto knygo autorius. Vienas iš tų žmonių, kuris yra ikona žmonėms, tikintiems mokslai, rodimais grįsta medicina ir nenuilstantis tokios medicinos propaguotojas. Hello, Paul. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, could our lives come back to normal as it used to be, or we just need to use to the new normal? I think it's going to take a long time for us to get back to normal. I mean, right now, as you walk down the street in, in America, you see every person who walks in the other direction as a potential threat. You see them as someone who potentially has a, a virus that can kill you, number one. Number two is that, that people can, can uh, shed this virus or be infectious when they're asymptomatic, when they have no symptoms, so therefore everybody's possible. And also you know that the virus can live on surfaces, so everything you touch is a problem. Um, I think it's going to take us a long time to calm down from that, years, I would imagine. But Donald Trump said recently that coronavirus will go away with or without vaccine. At least he believes in it. Do you believe, it, believe in it? <laughs> yeah, so Donald Trump isn't always right about the science, to say the least. Um, I, I think that we'll see. Uh, you know, certainly SARS and MERS, which were two previous novel coronaviruses, just lasted for a year and then they were gone. That's obviously not this virus. This is a very different virus. I think it's likely this virus will be with us for a few years. But as there, if there's a greater amount of population immunity, I think that its spread will lessen. And I agree, though, with Bill Gates, who said that we'll, we'll never really completely eliminate this until we have a vaccine. But I think we can make a vaccine. Uh, since you are not just a horror of all the anti-vaxxers uh, around the world, but also one of the co-inventors of, uh, of the vaccine against rotavirus, share your opinion with us, please. Will we have a vaccine against COVID-19 anytime soon? I think it's possible that we could have a vaccine uh, by next year by the year 2021, probably by the middle of next year. I think that's possible. Everything would have to go right. Um, we just got the strain, you know, a few months ago, and, and nobody really knows how to make the vaccine. Uh, you know, we, we, everything's possible. We could take the virus and kill it in the same way we make the polio vaccine. We could take the virus and weaken it in the same way that we make the measles vaccine. We could just take a part of the virus, that surface protein, which is the way we make the hepatitis B vaccine. We could take a, a vectored virus, meaning take, take a weakened virus and then clone into it the gene that codes for that surface protein of coronavirus, which is the way we make the Ebola vaccine or the dengue vaccine. Or we could take a completely different approach, a genetic approach, where we take the gene that codes for that coronavirus surface protein and then, then inject it as DNA, inject it as messenger RNA, and then your body makes that protein, that coronavirus protein, and then your body makes an immune response to that protein. So the bad news is we don't know how to make the vaccine. The good news is there are more than 70 companies across the globe that are trying to do this. There are hundreds of millions of dollars that are being spent on trying to make this vaccine. So I, th I think it will happen. There's, there, there's every reason to believe that you can make a vaccine because natural infection appears to protect against challenge, as was shown with human coronaviruses. There's every reason to believe that'll be true for this virus also. Uh, let's talk about uh, the fact that it takes more than 20 years to develop and to test uh, the vaccine in ordinary way, right? Uh, can some ordinary steps to be uh, skipped if it's needed and uh, what steps it could be then? Well, so this is not an ordinary vaccine. I mean, you don't, when, when, when people make vaccines, like when we made our rotavirus vaccine or when the measles vaccine was made or mumps vaccine or German measles vaccine, usually it's only one or two companies that are making it. There's not 70 plus companies that are making it. So there's far more of an effort to make this vaccine. So I think it can be made more quickly. I think the step that you don't want to skip is the so-called phase three trial. You want to make sure that before this vaccine is put into the arms of people in this world, that it's tested in a large pro perspective, placebo-controlled, so-called phase three trial, making sure that it's safe when given to at least 10,000 and preferably more like 20,000 people, and making sure that it's it's at least to some extent effective. I do think that, that 
what's going to be unusual about this vaccine is I think when it then rolls out into the general public, I think then we'll really know about whether there's any unusual safety profile problem or safety problem and just exactly how effective it is. So we are doing things in this kind of break the glass way and this sort of do it as quickly as we can right way because, you know, at least in the United States, between one and 2,000 people are dying every day from this virus. So the benefits are definitely great if we can make a vaccine. Uh, what happens if COVID-19 vaccine will never be developed? Could it be such a uh, um, development of, of things? No, I think it'll be developed. I, there's every reason to believe you can develop it. I mean, there were studies done um, years ago where they, there are four circulating human coronaviruses. There was in the United States every year they account for about 15 to 20 percent of the respiratory viruses infections that come into our hospital every year. There were studies done years ago where they took adult volunteers, they inoculated them with one of these strains of human coronavirus, then they waited a year and inoculated them with the same strain to answer the question: Are you protected? Does natural infection protect you? against disease associated with reinfection? And the answer was yes. So that's good. I mean, you know, there's, there, for example, gonorrhea is a disease you can get again and again. It, the natural infection doesn't protect you. Strep throats are something you can get again and again. So natural infection doesn't protect you. Here, natural infection protects you. If that's true, then you can make a vaccine. Uh, what would be your thoughts when humanity will be safe uh, bearing in mind this all uh, threat of COVID-19 can we talk about some certain date or something like that so I can take a guess and I'll, I could be completely wrong but my guess is I think within two years between population immunity the likelihood likelihood of developing a vaccine and the fact that we have contained this virus in part by our social hygiene distancing masks hand washing I think you'll see a gradual uh, a lessening of this virus and eventually I think it'll be eliminated I'm going to guess in a few years and then we'll be able to get, fully go back to our lives as normal uh, in, in such a case, uh, let's talk about Olympics, uh, one of the most important global sports events. Uh, games were postponed because of corona uh, pandemia. Uh, if the vaccine will not be developed by uh, next summer on time, that allows athletes and spectators to, be, to feel safe and to be safe in Tokyo uh, next summer, would it be wise to held games anyway? So the question is, what's the goal? I mean, if the goal is to eliminate any cases and deaths from coronavirus, this COVID-19, then we should probably stay inside for the next two years. That can't be the goal. The goal has to be to lessen the burden of the impact. Even if there's a vaccine, I think the vaccine likely will protect against moderate to severe disease associated with reinfection. I think it's unlikely actually to protect against asymptomatic disease associated with reinfection or mild disease. So you still might, might even if you're vaccinated, you still might shed a little bit of the virus. That's possible. So I think we have to kind of set up what is our goal. The goal should be not to overwhelm the healthcare system so that you can't take care of these patients as well as other patients that need acute or intensive care. Um, that's the goal. So if you can't have as a goal preventing any of these cases in the future. So there's a price to pay. I think that if you if we have sporting events, like in the United States, we canceled the hockey league season, we canceled the NBA season, we're in the midst of canceling the baseball season, um, we're on the verge of canceling the football season. I think that, that as we get more comfortable that we've gotten on top of this virus, although not a eliminated it, then people will go to these events, I think, with masks on, making sure they wash their hands, but there can't be social distancing. You can't have social distancing when 67,000 people go into a football stadium. So then people have to realize there's going to be some risk that they're taking when they do that. Oh, talking about the price of human lives, uh, different countries took very different measures from uh, hard lockdowns like here in Lithuania or to almost no restrictions like in Sweden. Uh, which way do you prefer as a scientist and as a doctor? No, I, th I think that the way that, that, uh, that, that Germany did it, the way that, uh, that, that Denmark, Finland, I mean, the, the countries that surrounded Sweden did it, I think that was the right way. Lock down, try and get on top of this, and then slowly come back into society. I think Sweden made a big bet. Their bet was 
let's just take a more laissez-faire attitude. Let's just to do what we normally do. And by doing that, we're going to have far more people infected. And therefore, this, this can stop the virus spread. Because if people are infected, they'll be immune. And therefore, the virus isn't going to be able to infect people who are immune. But I think that, that I think you can never really develop true population immunity with natural infection. I think the only way to get population immunity is with a vaccine. So their attitude is, you know, wait till you uh, the, the other countries suffer that second or third wave. We won't suffer that second or third wave. I'm not so sure, sure they were right about that. Certainly in terms of deaths per million, that, that country, Sweden, was worse than any of the other surrounding countries. So could you compare, please, what would be your prediction, uh, again, uh, because nobody knows for sure, how uh, that next wave of COVID-19 might look if it will happen? It seems that it will happen by comparison with the first one. Yeah. You know, in the United States, we, we're just going back to work. I mean, there, there are states like Georgia that is now just going back to work. In a number of states, about half the United States, states in the United States, are now starting to loosen restrictions and go back to work. But it's not in any sort of sensible way. I mean, the way Germany did it, I think, was a wise way to do it, which is, you know, do thorough testing, see where the virus is spreading, see how quickly it's spreading, see how dense the population is in which it's spreading, and then you can make an informed decision about who should go back to work and when they should go to back to work and how they should go back to work. We didn't do that. We just sent people back to work. And so we're in the midst of a grand national experiment to see really who should have gone back to work and who shouldn't have. And I think we're going to learn that lesson the hard way. But I I don't think we're, we're at the point now where we're going to overwhelm the healthcare system anymore. Even though I think there's going to be a bump in cases as people go back to work and are more susceptible to or more likely to then uh, be infected with this virus, I think we're not going to overwhelm the healthcare system anymore. So that's good. And, you know, there's the other part of this. So there, this is a two-part pandemic. The first part is the suffering, hospitalization, and death caused by the virus. But the second part is massive joblessness, which is going to lead to massive homelessness, especially among the poor and the vulnerable in our country. And with that massive homelessness will come food insecurity and then all the health care problems that are associated with massive joblessness, like domestic violence, child abuse, depression, suicide. That's going to be the second part of this, this pandemic. And, and that, that counts too. That's something we need to prepare for. Well, it's good to know then, uh, that scientists uh, all around the world are working that it will never happen, or at least we will do not feel it so severe. Uh, Paul, I know you have some special relations, if uh, I may say so, with Lithuania in the past of your family. Could you describe it, please? Yeah, well, my, my grandfather was born in Lithuania. Um, his name was Afsa Ovitz, Afsa Ovitz. And then when he came to the United States, the uh, immigration board changed the name to Afit. But that's not our original name. So, yes, I have a direct connection to Lithuania. It was double pleasure to have you here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ir atsisveikinu su Paul Ofit, kuris yra Filadelfijos vaikų ligoninės pediatras, infekcinių ligų profesorius ir vienas iš rotaviruso vakcinos kūrėjų. O taip pat ir nenuilstantis kovotojas, populiarinant mokslo įrodymais grįsta medicina. Ačiū, kad žiūrėt. Ačiū, kad remiat laisvės televiziją. Iki.